Welcome to The Craft. I'm your host, Mae Globus. This podcast is a collection of intimate conversations on artistry, mastery, and life with talented, passionately curious creatives and entrepreneurs. Most are dear friends, some are those I've admired from afar. I hope you enjoy these conversations, this exploration of the humanity that connects all of us as much as I do having them. Thank you for being here and for listening. This episode is sponsored by Happy Fox Health, a natural supplement brand focused on sea moss, a marine algae that has 92 out of 102 essential nutrients that your body needs to thrive and regenerate. I've used a number of their products and found it's really given me clarity of mind. Visit happyfoxhealth.com and use promo code THECRAFT for an exclusive 15 to 20% discount off your first product purchase. CJ Swanton is in a league of his own, a man of impeccable taste. A longtime communications professional, he launched his career in Vancouver as part of the Obaki team before moving to New York for many years. There he works with labels and brands such as Speranza Schooler, Jason Wu, Isaac Mizrahi, G-Star, Gola, and Lars Anderson through Mao PR and eventually his own agency, Omen PR, doing press and producing shows for New York Fashion Week. Now back in Vancouver, CJ returned to his roots at Obaki as their director of communications. Though born in Edmonton, Alberta, he was raised in Victoria, moving between the homes of his parents who had divorced when he was young. His upbringing was complicated at times as he navigated family dynamics and being in the closet. It was when he found the local punk rock scene that he began to come into his own. Eventually, CJ left Victoria for the mainland, beginning life chapters in Vancouver to New York and back again. In this conversation, we explore his relationship with his parents and siblings and the things he's reflected upon as an adult, how the punk rock scene supported him at a pivotal time in his teenage years, his journey to living in New York for nearly a decade and starting his own fashion PR agency, the creative thought process behind producing a New York Fashion Week show, a major burnout that led him to change his entire life, what he loves most about his husband Joey, and much more. Please enjoy this intimate conversation with the infectious and expressive C.J. Swanton, who has always marched to the beat of his own drum. C.J. Swanton. Yes. Welcome to the craft. <laughs> Thank you, May. <laughs> Thank you for being here. It's it's actually very much my pleasure. Mm, mm-hmm. It's so so nice getting to know you over the last couple months, I guess. Yeah, yeah. likewise. Like yeah. I keep saying, I feel like we have so many connections, and we were like one degree of separation away from each other. And mm-hmm. I've heard just so many incredible things about you. So it's been a, a pleasure for sure. Yes, yeah. yes. We were trying to connect the dots on yeah. where we we met, yeah. and we were saying uh, we share Melania De La Cruz as a, yes. a really good friend. Mm-hmm. But I was like, no, I've seen your name. It was earlier than Melania, and then I yeah. just remembered it was in my fashion writing days. Your name was on press releases that I would receive. Yes. And I was like, oh, that's where I first saw CJ's <laughs> yeah. name. Yeah, the PR tip. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. CJ at Obaki. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, let's take it way back. Let's sure. let's go all the way to Edmonton, Alberta, where you grew up. Yeah. So I was born in Edmonton and uh my parents divorced quite early when I was three years old. And so we were there, but at that time my dad moved to Calgary. And so we kind of split the next five years kind of in between Calgary and Edmonton. We would go every second weekend. I say we, my sister and I would go every second weekend to visit my father in uh, Calgary. And then when I was about uh, six and a half, seven, he moved to Victoria Mm -hmm. and then kind of enticed my mother to uh, come out there. Um, and so then we ended up relocating uh, to Victoria. But yeah, that's kind of where it all started. But interesting family story, to say the least. <laughs> um, my mother has been married seven times and my father has been married five times. So the bulk of those marriages came before us kids were born. Um, but it certainly made for uh, kind of an interesting family dynamic as we were certainly younger kids growing up for mm-hmm. sure yeah no I'm sure it did yeah mm. did, do you have any step siblings from their I do yeah. yeah so I have a younger brother and sister who are 10 and uh and 12 years younger than I am and through uh, a later marriage of my father's 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we're not even step siblings. Like we're so close that it's not even that kind of title doesn't ever really come into it. We're incredibly tight as a sibling group. Um, and, and have always kind of made that a mission, like to, to kind of, kind of re-solidify that concept of family because everything else was so crazy around us. I Mm -hmm. think that the one thing that was stable and certain was like that core sibling relationship. Ah, That makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That was the stability, not necessarily like the parents, but you guys as a unit. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to, to know now, now that you're older and reflecting on, you know, the stat that you just told me with yeah. your parents remarrying so many times. Yeah. Like, how do you look back at that and observe that as an adult? Well, I think my perspective has changed massively as an adult. And as I sit here with you today, then it has it, it's evolved and changed and morphed through every phase of my own development, right? Like it was very problematic for me when I was younger, trying to reconcile in particular, um, I think my mother's relationships and, and her the way that she approached relationships, I think was quite difficult for me. And, you know, when you're young and you still have this construct of what a traditional family is supposed to look like, I think there's also very clear gender roles within that. I think there's even, I think back and I'm sure there was an inkling or a predisposition in my thought process to think that it was okay that my dad was moving on to another wife, but it was wasn't quite as okay if my mother was moving on mm. to another husband, which is so bizarre in right. retrospect. But but I think that those things very much do exist within the, the mind of a child, right? Mm-hmm. And so so it was tough in that, um, you know, it when we moved to Victoria, my, my dad kind of enticed my mom out. She always hated Edmonton winters, and who wouldn't? Um, So she was kind of enticed by this idea of living on the West Coast. She had grown up here and had grown up in White Rock. So I think she wanted to come back very much. And so moving back and I was eight years old and that's kind of the time that I really start and I'm able to kind of start looking back and I really started formulating those kind of formative years, those memories, right, of like where I'm able to really dig into to situations and emotions in a more visceral way than I was maybe at a, before we left Edmonton. Mm. That was almost like this kind of shift in, in my ability to, to look back and reflect on what had happened. But, um, you know, when we were in Victoria, it was my mother, there was a very strange dichotomy because my mother was very much a single mother. We saw, we saw my dad's on the weekend, every second weekend, and then for a month or so in the summer. And the occasional holiday, we never wanted to spend Christmases with him because home felt like it was with my mom. But my dad was, you know, at the same time when we did visit with him, it was amazing. But my mom was a single mother. We lived in a, a, like a, like not a housing co-op, but we lived in a townhouse and kind of like looking back, I'm sure it's not the worst part of Victoria and it might have changed a lot, but we lived in Gordon Head and that comparatively to where my father lived, which was in a very affluent part of town, was just a, a, a big juxtaposition. And so we would go and spend time with him out on his yacht or we would go out and do these kind of very extravagant things and and looking back it was clearly him trying to show his affection through through money and through those kind of gestures but we would come back and come back to a very comfortable life with my mother like I I always say this that we never wanted for anything my mother worked her ass off to give us everything that we wanted and she was she was a provider in every sense of the word and so we never wanted for anything but she had to work for everything and my father you know he was a successful businessman and an entrepreneur and so there was I think some resentment there um just even from her perspective on how we would come back talking about all these great experiences that we'd had you know with him on the weekend and and just really now I'm able to look back and see that she was just trying to do her very best but I can totally understand how she would have grappled with some I don't know not jealousy isn't the right word, but that, you know, she would be just pissed off having to hear about it because knowing now what I do about everything about the relationship, like my mom walked in on him fucking her best friend. Sorry, am I allowed to swear? On yeah, of course. Paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do it too. <laughs> I cuss like a sailor. So watch out. Um, <laughs> you know, walking in on him with her best friend. And so there was a lot of resentment there that, you know, at that age, we just didn't know as children, you know, and so. But really, as, as we kind of continue to kind of live our lives and, and grow up there in Victoria, I now am able to see that all of the relationship choices that she made for herself were really 
just to provide for us kids. Mm -hmm. And so there was a sense that she was still in a very earnest and sincere way looking for that perfect relationship for herself. I believe she wanted that for her own reasons, you know, in a very real way. But a big part of that was also just wanting to give us kids um, everything she couldn't, you know, and in, in like a material way. And so, um, you know, I, I'm able to have that, you know, kind of hindsight now. But when I was, a, you know, an early teenager, a preteen, um, I didn't have that clarity, you know. Mm -hmm. And so all I had was, you know, one relationship to another. And, and what resulted was an inability for myself to really form a connection with any of the men that she brought into our lives. Mm -hmm. Because I remember still thinking, you know, uh, just that, it's this idea of like, you're just a flash in the pan. Why am I going to invest any emotion in you? And so I started kind of having to examine adult relationships and understand what they kind of emotionally meant in a much more real way than I think other eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds have to, mm -hmm. um, and kind of having to dissect the meaning behind them. But as all of that was happening, there was this kind of like low key hatred that was brewing for any new relationship that she would bring into the picture because I just saw it as an upheaval, uh, upheaval and a disturbance kind of, and, uh, and yeah, it wasn't great for mm -hmm. sure. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as I then continued to progress into my early teenage years, it, that's really, I think when my mother and I were really butting heads the most. And it was, you know, as I was figuring out who I was as a person, but really just, you know, this idea that, that she that her relationship choices were creating a ton of instability in my life and you know as a teenage kid you are the center of the universe right and so i didn't have the ability to understand the other people uh, that were being affected by her choices it was all just about how i was feeling and um yeah i wish i often think that i wish i could have you know had the kind of clarity that i do now back then because i would have treated her much differently you know mm. It's hard to when you're a teenager, though. Of course it is. Yeah, of course it is, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. We, we don't even understand the nuances of, no. of life just just yet. But no. I do find that it's really interesting also being um, someone who's seen my mom divorced a, a, mm -hmm. a few times mm -hmm. is it's really interesting how um, parents try to show their love, particularly in split ups with things and Oh, yeah. And material things like cars and trips and I think like it's like all very of these common, things. Right? I think it's extremely common. Um, but in reflection, being an adult, looking back at that, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like, oh, you know, what I really needed was more like emotional support. Sure. Like or more just hardcore time. Yeah, time. <laughs> like, how, like how are you doing through yeah. all of this too um, rather than, you know. Totally. The brand new car I got when I was 16. Exactly. You know? I mean, that was nice when I, you know, as totally. well, but of yeah. course. <laughs> but yeah, in reflection, I was like, oh, yeah, that would have been better yeah. to have the, the of time. Course. And let me just clarify here that my, my father was always an incredible dad. He just mm -hmm. did those things because by nature, that's who he is. I think there was definitely an element of guilt that was also fueling it. But I always, I had nothing but the best relationship with him. He was the first person I came out to as a queer person. He was he was the person that I laughed with the most. He still is. And so I, I, it was hard for me when my mother in those moments where she was, I could see her so frustrated with our connection with him. But I always felt like, why do you, my opinion was, why do you have these feelings towards him? He's so great, mm. you know, and which I think probably made it even more difficult for right. her, you know. Uh, so it's so, yeah. it's so complicated yeah. being human. Yeah. I mean, and here's the other thing I'll say there, which we didn't really talk about. We haven't spoken about previously, but um, bef in my early years when I was, you know, right the same year that my parents got divorced when they were, when, when I was three years old, um, my mother had a daughter from a previous marriage, um, from her marriage before my father. Uh, her, her name was Angie. And so she was my older sister. And I just looked at her as being my sister. But my dad had adopted her and was raising her like his own daughter. And uh, the year that they got divorced, we were he was driving us back to Edmonton from Calgary right before Christmas. We had been visiting him for the week leading up to Christmas. And, uh, and four days before Christmas, he was driving us and he fell asleep at the wheel. And she flew through the windshield and was killed instantly. 
And my sister and I, my other sister Jen and I were both in the car mm. and and survived. Um, but that kind of trauma for my mother to deal with, then moving forward, is the same year that they had just been divorced. He had now, in her mind's eye, killed her daughter. And mm. every time that she would have to look at him for the rest of our lives and their interactions as parents for both my, my, my existing sister and I, would have been completely brutal. And so that also colored their relationship in a very real way. It took my mother years and years. She still wasn't over it when she passed away um, a few years ago. And, you know, it, because it was right before Christmas, that tainted Christmas for the rest of my life, essentially. She wouldn't, there were still Christmas presents wrapped for Angie under the tree mm. that she refused to even move for up to a year afterwards. So the trauma that comes from losing a child, I can't imagine. Um, but I saw how deeply and profoundly that shook my mother and and then also how it affected her relationship with my father you know because he was he was with his new girlfriend he had been out the night before he had you know and so he had just fallen asleep on a very treacherous road and something horrible happened but it mm. it affected how she was able to relate to him for the rest of her life and and in my opinion like understandably so Mm -hmm. um but it was it was certainly something that affected their dynamic obviously yes <laughs> yeah. yes and all of that trickles down to I'm, I'm sorry that's so much to go through even yeah. for, you, for you i'm, I'm so yeah. sorry to hear that it's crazy i mean we i you know I, I feel like i've processed it it's still sad obviously there's those moments on certain anniversaries and stuff where you know at least my my sister who is still very much alive and i you know, always connect and talk and remember. And, uh, but, you know, I was so young. My, my older sister at that time was uh, six years old. So Jen, that's her name. Shout out to Jen, uh, was six. So she would have had m many more memories of Angie than I would have. Um, I do have strange cinematic snippets of that day that it happened. Like I remember being in the car and, and uh, my dad's girlfriend said that, that, my my two sisters in the back could take their seatbelts off to play footsies mm. and I was in the front with my dad and his girlfriend and I remember that and then the next thing I remember is being in a hospital and my sister Jen had long white blonde hair at that time and just seeing her on a stretcher next to me but like the movie Carrie kind of soaked in blood mm. you know so I have these little visual snippets and I do have a couple of really good also quite cinematic memories of of my sister Angie so it's it's terrible. It's something that's definitely marked my life and, and my family's life in a, in a more major way. But yeah, I mean, I can't, I just, it broke my heart a million times over for my mother watching her have to reconcile that for the rest of her life, which she never was able to fully do, understandably. Mm. You know, I still mourn my first dog <laughs> and I'm not downplaying losing an animal because it was one of the most difficult things I've gone through, but just, I can't even imagine what a mother goes through, right? Yeah, it's, it's an immense, Im yeah. immense amount of, of grief. Yeah, so it wow. definitely affected their my, her relationship with my father moving forward in a quite a, quite a visceral way. Mm. Mm. What what was she like? If you if you sort of I mean that all of that is a part of her. Yeah. But if you were going to describe her yeah. her personality, yeah. Like, what, what my would you mother. Say? Yeah. Oh, she was. She had a very infectious personality, a very strong personality. She was very opinionated, very hardworking, very stylish, always done up to the nines. She, in the 80s, she used to have, like, pierced nails and, like, little, like, like bedazzled unicorns on them. And, like, she was <laughs> always in, like, heels. And she was always so well put together. And uh, she loved music. She loved having people around. There was nothing more than she loved than having a full house. Um, but she was a tough cookie, man. You didn't want to cross my mom. And she would be the first one to let you know if she didn't like something that was happening in any given situation. So she was a very strong personality, but also, you know, one of the most loving people I've ever met. And really now that, and again, the older I got, and even now that she's passed away, her only desire was just to, her main focus was to love on us kids. Was mm. That was really what it was. Like family was her biggest motivation and and a sense of closeness uh, within that and 
and she always valued um, us being together. And, like, and so that I think is something really special. Um, but now, I mean, even, you know, you always, and again, we had our moments for sure. Like I said, in my teenage years, it was real rough. But fortunately, you know, as I got older, I was able to have that kind of epiphany where I kind of, my, my, my positioning towards her shifted. And so we were, we became very, very close and remained very, very close for the rest of her life. And so it was, you know, she was an incredibly dynamic, very layered woman, but uh, very charismatic, very charming and beautiful as all get out. (laughs) I mean, all those descriptors sound like you. (laughs) I was like, oh, he might as well be talking about himself. um... (laughs) Stylish, infectious personality. (laughs) I mean, I'll take it. I don't have, I don't have nails that are done up like that, but, uh, (laughs) but no, yeah, she was, she was one in a million for sure. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. What about you? What were you like as a kid? I think I was always the class clown. I was always a ham. You know, it's funny now. I mean, we can, I'm sure maybe we'll talk about this later, but it took me like four times to come out to my mom. She's like, no, it's just a face. And looking back, it's like, how did you not know this when I was like (laughs) literally five years old? Um, So I was, I loved music. I was always singing, but I was also a huge bookworm. I, when most other kids were out, you know, playing sports or out doing whatever normal kids do, I was reading voraciously. Like I was obsessed with, strange thing is I became obsessed with ancient Egypt and had to buy every single book about ancient Egypt when I was eight years old and learned everything about like the entire history of that ancient culture like just weird things I was obsessed with kind of knowledge but also at the same time loved you know singing along to a Madonna cassette and loved you know loved very much like was obsessed with style like I always I remember as far back as I can remember always having to choose my own clothing my mother giving me you know the freedom to do that um and that was you know that was me up until you know I think early teens teenage years like when I started kind of reckoning with being a queer person and and being gay and what that meant like and and I think that started shifting a lot of my personality because I think like you and I have spoken about it's like that's it wasn't a time where there was as much support or resources available, you know, if you were a gay person or a queer person. It just wasn't available, and it was still something that was, you know, very much kind of, uh, I don't want to say looked down on, but it was something you had to keep protected. It was something that I felt was like a really big secret that if I let anyone know, it would be it for me. I'd be done, whatever done looked like, you know. And so I think as a teenager, I started going inward a lot, um, you know, but I, I started, uh, again, distancing myself from my family a lot, um, particularly from my mother. Um, and I think a lot of that kind of happy, I was still, you know, cracking all the jokes and still those same, like those same kind of elements of my personality were definitely still there. But I was suddenly like I had I could feel, you know, it's every teenage kind of evolution when you're going through hormones and figuring out who you are as a person is an awkward thing. It just is, you know, your body's still figuring out what it's doing, all of those things. And on a psychological level, you know, when you are trying to figure out who you are as a person, you know, sexually, it, it back then in particular added this extra element that, like I said, was something that I knew I had to keep secret. You know, it was it was normal to hear people say fag. It was normal to hear people say, oh, that's so gay as a negative, you know, uh, kind of adjective. And so it was just all of those things where everything that society was telling me around me was that this was something that would never be OK, wasn't OK. And I had to hide it, pretend like it wasn't the reality. And also then but at the same time, still have to figure out who I ultimately was, which was, you know, I look back and it makes me sad that, you know, 13 year old CJ didn't live today. Because I saw, I often think that I'm like, how, what would my trajectory and my evolution have been like if I lived in 2022 as a 13 year old? Mm-hmm. It would have been, I think, drastically different in terms of um, self confidence and when I was able to finally develop that. Um, in so many ways, who knows? Like I think sometimes in a very granular level, I'm like, would that even affect what I'm doing today? Like because I just had to hide such a big part of me for so long, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's such a tough thing to, to have to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially 
for someone who sounds like you are very expressive. Yeah. As younger, yeah. as a younger person, to, yeah. to have to really reverse that. Yeah. And so I think, again, it's the thing that really saved me in those years was subculture. You know, like I, I was also like a very diligent student. And so I loved being able to do well at school, but I hated the kind of social aspects of school. And so when I was 13, I basically discovered that there was this thriving punk rock scene in Victoria. And I would see these show posters stapled to telephone poles. And I would see these kids that looked like they were kind of cool and different than everyone else. And so, you know, I went out and I, I basically, you know, I, I, I searched for this scene and I found it. And it was really through an immersion in that community that I found my people. And it was the place that as a teenager, I could feel safe because when I was at school or at people who were hurling insults at me or in some cases throwing rocks at my head, like whatever it was, I could feel like I had this kind of the suit of armor on that was like, I'm into something different than you. I'm cooler than you. You don't understand what this is. This is my community. And it was that that kind of, yeah, gave me like a sense of safety. Mm -hmm. And and so it was really within that community that I started kind of understanding like queer connections to subculture. And back then, Garrett, like understand that there's no internet, there's no nothing, right? So, you know, I'm going to the library and I'm reading up about like the origins of punk rock. And like, just again, like I had to seek out all this information, but I had all these amazing people. Most of them were much older than me. All my friends were much older than me because like I said, I was like 13, 14 years old. Um, but it was really the thing that, that made me feel okay with my, at that time, my weirdness, you know, mm. air quotes. Um, so and they were very accepting. Completely. Yeah, yeah, completely. Listen, I was still dating women, mm -hmm. but I think that there was, there were queer people around me and it's, it made me feel more like I, like I, I had a posse and I, and I didn't have to worry about if someone was going to beat me up if I spoke something in, in the wrong way or you know, like going into this, I said, I'm very self-conscious about even the sound of my voice, because I think that was is grained into you at a very young age that if you have, you can sound gay, which now in retrospect is also completely ridiculous. But I think that stems from just like growing up the person that I am in elementary school and in junior high school and, and kind of all of the, you know, predictable insults that come along with that. But it was this community and through this kind of subculture that I finally kind of felt like myself mm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah. no absolutely yeah and that's so important that you were able to find yeah, I'm some so kind grateful of now. Su support yeah. like looking back right i'm and now like reconnecting or my i still am friends with a couple of people that i knew back then and hung out with back then and and you know we're all still the same we all still kind of march to the beat of our own drums but it's you know i'm so grateful for that period because it really was that thing i think that saved me as a teenager and made me feel like uh it was okay to be whatever whatever i was you know mm -hmm. yeah mm. yeah and so let's go past high school sure. and into yeah. your schooling yeah and yeah, how you got into communications and sure, journalism, yeah, so, which is also a very interesting journey yeah. for you. You've had many lives within one life, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, I feel like it, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Probably many more to come. Uh, so I think, again, growing up in Victoria and growing up kind of always wanting something different, I think. There's a sense of, in particular, it felt very much like a small town. But I always knew that Vancouver was, you know, just a ferry right away. And so I would come over here and my mom was incredible. She would let me like go away for the weekend with my friends to come to a show here or go see a band here. And so I had enough taste of that at, when I was still in high school where I just knew all I was focused on was just getting out of Victoria. And so I moved to Vancouver and kind of was trying to figure out what I wanted to do again, kind of, um, and wasn't quite sure, worked at some restaurants, was kind of looking at school and basically ended up in a, you know, in a communications public relations program and, and decided that I just kind of, something clicked and it was like, this is, I was always interested in language. I love language and, uh, and, and I love kind of, yeah, I love communicating. I love communicating and communication. So it just kind of clicked for me. 
And so I kind of threw myself into it and, and fell in love with it as, as a kind of craft. And, and, um, but I also, again, once I did that, I realized that there are all these different facets to what communications looks like. Mm. And I kind of was introduced to the idea and the concept of what PR and public relations has traditionally been. And, and uh, something was just like, this is the thing I want to do. And it clicked. And so I, um, you know, I was, while well, I was in my program, there was an, an opportunity to do in, you know, a six month internship at the end of it. And so I set my sights on, um, on an agency in New York City that I really wanted to work for. And I, you know, it was, to me, it was, if this is what I wanted to do, I realized that this was something that was done in every kind of industry. And then when I started doing more research and realizing that the fashion industry kind of, you know, had this own community of publicists and, and communicators that were also kind of on the front lines, it was, I just really wanted to sink my teeth into it. And so I started hounding this, uh, agency in New York and basically emailed them every day for almost two months and called them and called them and called them applying to their internship program and then finally one day I got a call back from the coordinator and she's like well I don't you're crazy enough to have basically stalked us for this long so come on up Canada uh <laughs> so I did and so I went to New York City and moved there for my first time and was instantly kind of swept up into the energy of the place and and thrown into what, what is admittedly still and back then was a very cool agency. They do all the kind of cool kid downtown PR stuff. And, you know, my first my within a, my first week of working for them, I was, you know, at an event that we were throwing that Debbie Harry was hosting. And my entire job for the evening was just to basically be her handler. So I was just hanging out with Debbie Harry for the whole night, you know, and as a kid from kind of, you know, moving from Canada to New York, you know, just kind of thirsty for a new experience. It was like, this is what I wanted to do. And I saw, I kind of, it started to kind of fall into place quickly that this is really what I wanted to kind of put all of my energy towards. So I just worked my ass off for them and did everything that I could and Within kind of less than a month, they offered me a full-time position at the agency outside of my internship. And so, uh, but there's this little thing called immigration PR, you know, or immigration, you know, law, uh, sorry, that kind of was standing in the way. So I, you know, continued staying there for the length of that time and, and really wanted to kind of show them what I was made of and to kind of learn as much as I could. Um, but at that six-month point, they kind of, we, I sat down with the two owners and they again reiterated that they really wanted me to stay, but I just felt like I couldn't because I was so nervous that I was going to get busted by the cops. Like, you know what I mean? Like I felt every time I heard a siren, I felt like I was doing something wrong. Every time I saw a cop, I thought they were going to arrest me, which <laughs> is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Because I was actually there like, you know, with the right paperwork, but I just, I made the decision to leave, but understanding that it wouldn't be, you know, the last chunk of time I'd be spending in New York. And so I decided to come back to Vancouver and, and I did that. And then I found out that, uh, you know, shortly after I left that agency was audited by immigration and, uh, they lost a couple of people. And so it was, it turns out the right move to make, but, mm -hmm. but really that first kind of six month chunk, I just, I just fell in love with, with kind of the industry and with the city and I knew that that's where I really wanted to be but I knew I had to kind of you know get my shit together and, and get a visa and do all the things to get back there properly so I decided to come back to Vancouver mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this is where you um started to do nonprofit PR yeah and I then... did so I came back and I got actually a job working for a drug and ha drug and alcohol treatment center and so I was their director of community relations. And that was a big eye opener for me. Um, it was kind of front lines. I was, they were, you know, putting treatment centers in residential neighborhoods. And so my job was to kind of deal with local media and defend off, uh, you know, you know, local kind of, you know, the local population's concerns about having, you know, a house full of, you know, addicts living next to their children, all those kinds of things, which... Uh, so I had to kind of field all of, you know, basically host town halls and stuff. So again, I, I, like I, I was able to earn my chops in terms of like community relations and media relations, but it was an interesting role, 
Um, it was with a, a extremely Christian organization. They were evangelical Christian, and they used to have prayer meetings for me during staff meetings to exercise me of demons of homosexuality. Mm. <laughs> so, so I had signed a year contract with them, and it was a really great learning opportunity, but I was like, no, nope, this isn't going to work. So I left that role after that. I stuck it out for the year and left that role. And then I was like, I have to just sink my teeth into whatever Vancouver's fashion community looks like. And so I, I did that and learned that it was pretty small and then pretty mm -hmm. tight, particularly back then. This is, I don't know, 2004, 2005, I guess, maybe. Um, and so I, I basically found a job. Uh, I started off as an internship as well, again, working for a company called Chulo Pony. And Chulo Pony back then was a women's, uh, you know, contemporary fashion collection. Um, and uh, and so I started working there under their publicist as her basically her assistant. And she then became, you know, a big mentor for me moving forward. Um, and through that position, I basically met uh, who really became the, the biggest mentor in my life. His name is Jake Weeb. Um, I met him uh, through that role because he was very close with with Christina, who was my boss at Chulo Pony. And uh, so I met him and um, I was with Chulo, Chulo Pony, but basically decided to leave there. And I had a, a about a couple weeks period where I, I was just looking for work, trying to figure out what I was doing. And Jake Weeb called me up and asked me if I wanted to come in. And he had started working with a new company called Obaki and asked me to come meet with him and the owner, Trina, just to sit down and see if I was interested in a role. Um, and so I went and met with both of them. And uh, and before the end of the meeting, Trina uh, offered me the job, you know, as their PR director. And so, and I don't think director in terms of what sounds like, you know, quite a heavy title. Back then it was, the company was like a year old, you know, and it was a small team, but it was basically, you know, I'd be doing their PR and running all of the events and everything. And so I, I took the position and it was, you know, you know, one of the best decisions I think I've ever made in my life because Trina is still one of my best friends today. And, uh, and then I just learned so much throughout that tenure with that company that it's, um, I look back now and it's remarkable because again, it kind of taught me a lot um, just in terms of um, the importance of relationships and how long-standing relationships, particularly within PR and in any career, really can really drive your success in such an important, massive way. And And I learned so much. And throughout all of that, Obaki was in young fashion line, but it was exciting. There was a lot of kind of excitement around it. Even back then, there was this idea of exploring sustainability. And, and we were... I was traveling a lot, and so we would show at New York Fashion Week. Back then, it was a men's wear collection and a women's wear collection as well. And so we would, whether we would be going out to the Hamptons and to Shelter Island to do a campaign shoot, or whether we were going out to do a men's show during during Men's Week, or what you know, or whatever that looked like, um, you know, I was in New York City a lot, and we also had a New York-based PR team uh, at that time, and so I was managing them, and so I was in the city quite a bit and um and during one of those trips uh I was there for a fashion week and had decided to stay a couple of days afterwards um and it was during that time that I met my now husband um Joey at a barbecue in Brooklyn and uh and so I met him and and basically after that trip came back to Vancouver and uh and we started video chatting but which back then was like I think <laughs> just on Skype gmail or maybe or like through <laughs> gmail but not like as cute as like like g chat is or whatever um and so anyway so we kind of quickly fell in love long distance um but i this whole time i'd known still that as much as i loved my role with obaki and loved my relationship with with my boss trina it was it was still this idea that i had this bug in me that i knew i needed to really get back to New York City for my own goals and for what I knew I wanted to achieve with my career. And so I basically left Obaki and put in my notice to to make the decision to move to New York. And so, um, you know, I remember being terrified when I was telling her that I was leaving um, my boss, but she was so incredibly supportive and and just kind of, you know, 
egged me on in the best way and, and told me obviously that she was sad I was leaving, but that she knew this was something I had to do for myself. And so it was a big relief and it was, it was kind of, it, to me, it was a sign that it was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, the PR agency we've been working with there, I'd been going and, and working with them during my uh, paid vacation time with Obaki and, and volunteering during fashion weeks there to, to produce shows with them. And so they were able to sponsor me for my visa and I moved to New York City and basically packed everything up in a U-Haul and picked my husband up in Oregon and we drove to Manhattan to our apartment that we'd never seen before. Wow. (laughs) And then it was eight years there, no? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So it was, it was, no, it was longer than that. So I had my own company there for eight years, but we were there for almost 10. Yeah. Wow. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, when we got there, it was exciting. Um, You know, I thought I was going into this role with this new agency and I did, but, but, you know, I basically found out pretty soon after getting there that they didn't have the volume of work for me that they thought they would have and that they still needed me, but not quite as much. And New York City, you know, back then was obviously still a very expensive place to live. And I just knew that I was bound by immigration, by a specific visa, but I wasn't, there was no longer a full-time job for me, essentially. And so I kind of had to scramble and it was a terrifying time because Mm -hmm. I was so limited in what I could do. Um, legally. And so I, you know, after many late nights of, I think, you know, we were joking, but my husband and I were literally Googling like donating sperm and like donating bone marrow to make money. Like Mm -hmm. it was like, it was like, what can I do? Like dire (laughs) straits, man. Like it was not good. Um, But I just, I don't know. I just, suddenly I got this resiliency and I was just like, you know what? No, there's a way around this and I can do it. And I might blur some things legally. There might be a bit gray for a minute. Um, but she wouldn't be the only one doing no, that. No, <laughs> but I was like, I can do this and I can do it my own way. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to start my own agency. And looking back, it was, again, I think a totally crazy, wild thing for me to think with my level of experience and with my lack of relationships. Yes, I had people that I had already met there through the time that I've been working there that were already being very supportive. But I think it was, again, just like... I'm like, wow, that was a pretty bold move. Um, But I just did it. And so, again, I had, uh, there was a Canadian brand. Scott Waldhove is, you know. 212. 212 Shout out to Scott. And his business partner, Anthony, had a a women's ready-to-wear collection here in Vancouver. What is Anthony doing these days? I don't know the answer to that. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I just saw Scott the other weekend. Um, (laughs) So, anyways, but they... uh, I took them on as a client. They asked me if I would do their PR. They were my first client. And then uh, after them, I met another New York-based designer and took them on. And so before I knew it, I had four different collections that I was running out of my little shoebox apartment on St. Mark's Place in the East Village in New York. And it was now full of rolling racks. And (laughs) I was having editor meetings in my living room. And there were messengers coming in every day. And so this happened really quickly over the course of like, six months and then all of a sudden I was like oh shit I have like like six clients I was like this is a a thing this is a thing now and I had one intern that was helping me kind of do it all and this kid I had met who was just eager I think he had the same bug I had when I first got there and and I was like it was kind of I took a step back one day and kind of looked at the chaos in my apartment and I was like this is a real thing and I have to like kind of take it seriously so I got my first showroom space and It just kind of evolved from there. But it was, you know, I think from an early stage, it was called Omen PR. So for an early stage with Omen, it was me, you know, I'd seen in the short period of time I'd been working in PR in New York City. I'd seen kind of like A, how expensive it is if you're a brand who really wants kind of the kind of like top level representation. It was, it's so expensive. But then I saw this entire incredibly inspiring community of emerging brands in New York that needed that exposure but just couldn't necessarily afford it and so I made it my kind of mission to sniff out and work with the kind of best of the best of the emerging brands and to give them a home and to give them access to the same editors and the same opportunities but at a fraction of the cost and I would do that by taking on a lot of clients so I've I found a way to make it work financially but for myself but where I was able to kind of give them 
access to those same worlds that, mm-hmm. that you know, all of these kind of bigger brands just took for granted with eight, 10, 12, $20,000 a month, you know, retainers that they were able to pay these bigger agencies. And so again, I think it was pretty ballsy. I just decided to put my foot down and that was going to be who I was going to be. But it, you know, it really started tracking and, and, you know, I had, you know, fast forward, it was eight years of running Omen, but it was, you know, I think we carved out a very specific niche for ourselves. And it's one that I'm very proud of, because there's still brands that I kind of met in their first, second season who were in that position of needing or looking for that support that are thriving today and that are killing it, you know, Mm -hmm. and so it's, it's so exciting for me to look back and think on that. But it was, it was a lot. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you worked with some incredible fashion clients in, in your career. I mean, Carenza Schooler, Jason Wu, Isaac Mizrahi, G Star Gola, Lars Anderson, Dana Lee. These are these are really great names. And mm-hmm. I'm so curious, what is it about the fashion industry that you loved so much? I think I loved again, there's this I've always been a creative person for sure. But I've always been Again, like I think it's that marriage between creativity and communication. So it was the perfect access for me where I was able to, and I also love, fostering sounds like the completely the wrong word, but I love kind of being around that kind of kinetic energy of young talent that's really finding its footing. And so that for me was exciting and I loved the pace of it. I loved kind of the relationship making of it. Back then it was all still, and it's still very much as today, but it's still all about relationships that you're able to create with editors or with writers or with, you know, with vendors or whatever that looks like. And it was, I really thrived off of that kind of piece of it. But then I also, again, I really got off on the success of my clients, which sounds super cheesy, but it really is true. Like I really was rooting for all of these people. And I always said that I wouldn't work with a client unless I would wear their clothing myself, even if it was women's wear. If I was a woman, I'd want to wear it. Um, and I so, so I really tried to be very honest and intentional about the people I was working with. And I wanted to create almost a family. Mm. And, and for a moment there, that's what it felt like. There was this kind of bubbling underground of these emerging brands in the downtown scene in New York that were all vying for exposure. And it was... It was electric to be kind of in the center of it at that time. And absolutely, and in New York of all places, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm curious. I, You know, I've, I've loved fashion for a really long mm-hmm. time, too. And I am always really fascinated to look at shows and the yeah. creativity behind shows. Yeah. I'm curious, um, can you share your thought process or your creative process mm-hmm. when a client came to you and was like, hey, yeah. I want to do this show? What are the elements that start firing in your head? Yeah. For listeners at home, if you could see my face as, as soon as May mentions show production, I started grinning like a Cheshire cat because <laughs> he did. it still is, I think, the thing I missed the most about it. I love show production so much. And it was the, the time of year when you get to really kind of flex your your creative chops, you know, your creative muscles. And so I think it was, it would always be, you know, a client coming to me and they would have their collection. And, and, and more often than not, it was them sitting down with the actual, we'd sit down with the collection together and be like, what does this look like for you as a show? What's the vision? In many cases, I was like, not only what does it sound like, what does it look like, but what does it smell like? Like, how can we do this in a really dynamic way that in most cases was off-site? So off-site being like not showing at Bryant Park, not showing at Lincoln Center. Um, so, but still fighting for, you know, the right time slot on the fashion calendar, um, but doing things downtown, trying to get editors there. But so kind of designing the creative kind of, you know, kind of embodiment of their collection from head to toe, which was so exciting for me, you know, like there was client, you know, I got to work with an incredibly talented client named Rod Harani, who did these beautiful at the time, very kind of revolutionary uh, uh, unisex collections and, and just the creative energy that he would bring into a show. I remember like, you know, the day before a show at Milk Studios, which was a very big deal back in the day, like, him be like, oh, no, I want the entire place covered in black carpet at the last minute. So then I'd have to source, you know, like 5,000 square feet of black carpet and have it installed within 24 hours. So there's also this electric kind of kinetic idea of what the production machine looks like that was mm-hmm. also quite thrilling. You know, or I had another client that showed, I uh, got into a, a, you know, a W Hotel sponsored young designer showcase at Lincoln Center. And he had a very kind of post-apocalyptic collection and we brought in, you know, 50,000 pounds of rock salt. 
and created this kind of lunar landscape that the models kind of walked over. And we had a live string quartet playing, and then we I worked with this incredible perfumer to scentscape the entire place with this incredible uh, perfume called Revolution that smells like like burning asphalt and like gunpowder. And like it was just like again like getting that kind of to sink your teeth that kind of deeply into you know helping them embody yeah the kind of physical the physical you know spatial idea of what their what their collections look like was mm-hmm. so was so exciting and fulfilling for me for sure yeah because it's it is the sight of the clothing mm-hmm. but it's also like all the other senses like how are yeah. all the other senses firing yeah, around exactly it? for sure mm. you know and then also and then I also kind of got off on the you know like I like I said I really was trying to get the, the right eyeballs on on these collections for them so it was trying to make sure that I had the right people there which which isn't the production side of it it's the press side of it but that part I loved just as much and so just making sure that I was getting the right people there, that women's for daily would be there so that they'd be covering it you know that I had someone from Vogue there that I you know like all those things were big wins for for brands of that size back then and and for me as an agency you know it was thrilling to be able to do that and so fashion week was you know I think, you know, kind of the downfall of me having my agency in the end because it was so exhausting. Um, But it was also the thing that was was so thrilling. And back then it was just twice a year. You know, we weren't doing resort shows or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it was every, you know, February and September that it was just like this thrilling kind of give it your all kind of twice a year moment that kind of I I lived for, you know. Mm. Yeah. Do you miss it? I do miss it. Like, you know, I think I miss I miss all those kind of all the creative aspects that we've just, you know, talked about. I miss all of that stuff for sure. But I think as time went on, you know, I think it was becoming pretty clear to me that, you know, this was before like people were talking about the concept of burnout as well. And now I very clearly know that that's what I was beginning to experience in a very real way. Um, but it was, you know, I wouldn't see my husband for almost two months. Like it was just the hours and the time that you put into it. All of my poor staff back then, ugh, I was, it was a small boutique agency. I had like three or four full-time people and then an army of interns, but just thinking about all the hours and time and everyone was just there a hundred percent, 110%. No one asked questions. You didn't, it wasn't a question of if you had to stay at the office until four and then be on site at 6am the next morning. You just did it because that's what you did at that time. You know, and that was, it was, in, it was encouraged. It was, it was just kind of what the expectation was, you know, across the ind- the industry. It was just like you fucking show up and you do it regardless of what that kind of looks like. There was no like self-care. How's this going to make, how's this going to affect me no. and my mental health and my physical health that didn't come into the, the conversation at all. Oh, you know? internships were a very different beast back then. Like, oh, God, you know, yeah. you, you weren't paid and I <laughs> ever, if you were lucky, if you no. were gotten an honorarium and yeah, you, you were, I don't know. Yeah. Your mindset. I, I remember taking internships too and just being like, no, like this is my chance. You yeah. know, I, yeah. When I was in LA, I interned at Harrison Schriftman yeah. and you know, and I was like, no, I don't care. I am exactly, going right? to be there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to learn everything. Yeah. yeah, there was just like back then I felt like there was a you didn't care how much work you No, and you, you almost felt do. fired up by that, right? Yeah. You're almost yeah, like I'm going to show them I can do this all. Like yeah. it's, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um I read somewhere that yeah. you went to Sri Lanka and yeah. you were asked to come th- to go to go there and mm-hmm. do a couple of workshops yeah and I'm so curious to know with the experience bringing your North American yeah. experience to a very different yeah. market and culture yeah how your workshops were received you know what? it was a really incredible slightly bizarre opportunity but and I went there twice two years in a row um and so they had a Sri Lankan fashion week was basically a satellite for India fashion week which is kind of the largest kind of fashion week in that that part of the world and so I obviously had never been there before, but I had a um, an intern of mine at the time had uh, her father ran Sri Lankan Fashion Week, and so that was my introduction to him. He was in town in New York and asked if he could meet with me, which I thought was very weird. Um, but she was a, she had no idea even what it was about, and so I went and met with him. He offered me this this kind of opportunity, but they they wanted to showcase New York designers in Sri Lanka. Uh, and so the first year that I went, that's what it was. And I kind of, I, I select, I chose one of my designers. Her name was Carolyn. She designed a, a beautiful collection back then called Harare. 
And so we went down there um, and basically put on a show during Sri Lankan Fashion Week. But it was a beautiful over the top affair, like on the beach with this, like the, the production builder was absolutely insane. Like a 250 foot runway on the beach going into the waves flanked by traditional Sri Lankan fishing boats. Uh, I was treated like a king when I was there and it was really eye opening. And I made a lot of kind of really interesting uh, kind of connections and relationships. And so they also asked me to put on a series of workshops when I was there. That was kind of the fundamentals of fashion PR. And so I got to address kind of, uh, you know, a pretty big audience of, um, of Sri Lankan kind of media fashion personalities, kind of about how we did things in New York and got to have very kind of candid conversations and pragmatic conversations about kind of what the industry in New York looked like at that time. And so it was kind of cool to feel like a representative for, you know, in this part of the world because it was quite sexy and quite well done. And it was, you know, like I said, it was quite over the top. And so I think that first year, you know, was a big success. I think, you know, my client made some good business relationships, some kind of, you know, she was able to meet some stores that wanted to carry her. So, but then as soon as I got back, they asked if I would come back the next year and help them overhaul their production kind of methodology and the footprint of how they were doing shows um, to bring a, to bring not one, but now two brands back with me the second year to do more workshops, but then also to sit in with them and to kind of overhaul the production for for Sri Lankan Fashion Week. And so that was incredibly exciting again. Um, and again, like I said, just their their warmth and and just how I was welcomed there is something I'll remember forever. But also just a really cool experience. Like like I said, just the the type of people I was able to meet and also just to see this infrastructure that they had built that was really kind of showcasing these really regionally specific brands, but there was some incredible talent coming out of that part of the world. And and so, but really getting to kind of confront that and to interact with that. And then, but then having them asking me to kind of just from a very kind of logistics perspective, kind of look at how are we running shows? How are we sending girls out? How are we casting shows? You know, they had one person for 40 designers that was casting everyone's show. Like it didn't, it functioned completely different than what, you know, a New York Fashion Week did. So it was quite interesting, but kind of getting to work with them from start to finish on kind of ways that they could streamline and kind of optimize their production process as, as a kind of larger entity. So it was really cool. Mm. Yeah, it was really interesting. I have I have an observation, and yeah. we can put a, a pin in it because there is something to, yeah. that I do want to get into before we get here. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's interesting that you were asked to go to Sri Lanka and do this and yeah. you sort of see how... It, it works in another um, country because you're now back at Obaki yeah. and you're working with a lot of artisans from around the world. Yeah. And so it's like this nice little Interesting, connection. Right? That, yeah, that, I, guess I've, I haven't thought about that before, but I think you're right. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, we'll put a pin on in Obaki. Stick but a pin in it. Yeah. We'll stick a pin in it. But yeah. I do want to go back yeah. to you use the word burnout. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I know that you and I have talked about it. And yeah. you just, <clears throat> there was a point where you hit a wall. And I did. I started, I never, ever, it started happening about halfway through my time in New York. And again, like I was loving what I was doing, but I all of a sudden was running a company. Right. And so in a country that wasn't my own and it's and it's a it's a very specific skill set that I don't think I necessarily am meant to have or have entirely. But all of a sudden I was doing all the kind of really creative relationship based kind of side of the job that I really love. But I was also having to make sure the lights stayed on and paying all the bills and doing payroll and dealing with tax, like all of the things that were becoming really overwhelming to me on top of just the pace and the kind of that kind of relentless pace of, of the industry at that time and and that kind of again this is the beginning of kind of hustle culture before it was like a cliche fucking neon sign you know somewhere it was this was very much what what was kind of the atmosphere at that time and so I basically start I had my first panic attack I didn't know what it was or what was happening but it happened while I was at, at work in a meeting and I thought I was gonna die I thought you know my vision went down to a pinpoint I could feel my my stomach and my heart at the same time in my throat. And I thought, I just didn't know what was happening. I literally thought I was dying. And so I obviously went to the hospital and, and was told, no, you're having an anxiety attack. And, and that I had never, you know, yes, like everything I'd gone through, everything I'd lived, I'd never even, I was, you know, a gothy teenager, but only because I was a goth, but I was never, I never dealt with what I thought was like a serious depression or anxiety. And so I think that 
and in the pace I was living in New York, I think I was just, I was n- not allowing myself to touch base with my own body and with my own kind of mental health in any way, just because it was always what was next, what's the next meeting, what's the next thing I have to do, what's the next new client meeting, when's the next time I have to do payroll, like it was just that pace that I wasn't giving myself, you know, yeah, I never took an inventory of my, of what was happening within me, and so that opened up then, you know, uh, a relationship with, with a a couple of different doctors there that just kind of started plying me with more medications and me thinking that was the right way to deal with it. And so before I knew it, I was, you know, on a bunch of different anti-anxiety medications and antidepressants and still working at the, the pace that I had been, but I could feel myself getting sick, like, like, I'm like physically sick as well. And I could feel the stress of that mounting. And I, I, again, I was losing weight. I was, there was like physical things that were happening to me uh, on top of, you know, the, the kind of very real kind of, you know, uh, feelings associated with anxiety that, that again, now were just kind of so overwhelming. And so having to then deal with that, and it was a build up for sure. Like I said, it was over the course of like three or so years, um, that this really kind of happened maybe three or four years. Um, but towards the end of it, it was, it was brutal to the point where I was, I was debilitated and it was, I, I was brutally unhappy, brutally unhealthy. And, you know, it was a lot of hard conversations with my husband at that time being, you know, what do I do? Like, I love this. I love so much of what I do and I'm so proud of what I've built here but I can't do this anymore. And I struggled with that for probably two years of back and forth, knowing in my heart and my, like in my soul that I had to move on, but not being able to reconcile that and not being able to feel okay with it because there was this voice in my head that was telling me I was giving up in some way, which is so ridiculous, but it was very real in that moment, right? It was like, everyone's going to think you're a fucking poser. You're stepping away from everything you've just built. Why are you doing this? You're throwing it all out the window. But then there's this other kind of quiet voice in me that's like, it's okay to move on. It's mm. okay. There's a season for everything. Be proud of this. Move on. But it took a long time to kind of hear that voice and to, to be okay with it. But I think... You know, my husband has always been my biggest advocate and cheerleader, and I think he really kind of, he helped me understand that in a real way. And so I made that decision. I just knew I was going to run myself into an early grave, and I was going to, I was so disgustingly a workaholic that it was now compromising my own health. And it was, it was, you couldn't deny it. I couldn't deny it anymore. And so I, um... I just made the very difficult decision to to close down Omen. And so I didn't want to, I had lots of conversations with other people, other kind of work friends about selling off the agency. I didn't want to at all because I felt so passionate about the very specific vision that I had kind of built with my team and I didn't want someone else owning that. Mm. <laughs> and I still feel that way actually. But so, so I, that wasn't what it was about for me. I was able to place all my clients with other agencies if that's what they wanted to do. And we, you know, my husband and I had all, we'd been joking, you know, there's a still this kind of, you know, kind of contrast between LA and New York. But I, you know, I think we, I just wanted sunshine and I just wanted a sabbatical and I wanted quiet. And I've always been someone that regardless of whether or not it's right or wrong, I have always believed that sometimes geographical change is really important. And so for me, that's what I felt like we needed to do. I felt like New York, I finally was able to see that New York had given me the best years of my life, I think, in terms of of building up that confidence in my career and really kind of cutting my teeth and, and learning my craft in a real, real, real way, but that it was time to leave. And so it was bittersweet for sure. And not only that, all of the friendships, relationships that we had there, our whole family of friends, our chosen family of friends were in that city. And and so, but we decided to move to LA. And so we, again, we have, at that point, we had two very big dogs, Great Danes. And so we packed everything. It wasn't about getting on an airplane. We packed everything up into another U-Haul and uh, drove to LA. And uh, once, once we got there, I... You know, again, the idea was just for my husband, again, was so supportive. It was just for me to be able to take time and to do nothing if that's what I wanted to do. 
And you and, gardened. And, until I figured it out. <laughs> and I gardened, right? So that was my one thing. I was like, I wanted to live close to the beach and I want, I, we needed a house. I did not want to live in an apartment after spending that much time in New York City. <laughs> I wanted something with a yard. And not knowing at that time is because I wanted to garden so much. But then now, again, like in, a few months into it, that became my kind of daily routine and my passion. And I think I, my journey of kind of healing and coming down off the ceiling of all of that anxiety and all of that kind of self-inflicted kind of stress and, and tension that I accumulated over, over that almost decade in New York City, I kind of started releasing through gardening. My husband and I completely redid the landscaping in our yard. And I taught myself how to grow cannabis, which like myself completely just by reading a million books and, and learning myself. And so took that on as a hobby, but I just gardened all day, every day. And it was really, I think it was, you know, we all have our own kind of different aha moments and where we realize that we found the thing that can help us kind of heal, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was very much gardening which sounds funny but it really was you became a plant daddy <laughs> I, I did become a major plant daddy <laughs> and you have a lot of plants in your yeah, house yeah you've so seen it, my house I, it has continued that carries over for <laughs> sure but it was incredibly good and so while we were there I started you know I would still do the occasional freelance job for whether that was a gig in LA for a casting director friend of mine from New York or whether it was helping a friend who was a stylist if she couldn't be in town and I would style something for them like just random creative things and and uh but then again my old boss from Obaki Trina Peak who had remained one of my very dear friends over this entire course of time uh she was at my wedding anytime that she would do anything in New York as a brand still I would be there working with her and so we stayed quite close um but we would just we're just chatting and she you know was talking a lot about uh, what she was doing on the foundation side. So Obaki is very much a lifestyle brand, but then there's also the Obaki Foundation, which is this incredible, excuse me, philanthropic kind of counterpart to the brand that really is just, it. I get, I kind of get teary-eyed thinking about it because it's just driven by this one woman, but she, we've drilled over 3,500 clean water wells, you know, in Africa. Um, there's just the amount of, kind of work that she's done on a development level is just kind of mind boggling. But so basically the two companies work together and Obaki has traditionally, the profits from Obaki have funded the Obaki Foundation. And so the two kind of have lived side by side um, over the time that they've existed. But she was starting to talk about, you know, in all of her travels, you know, when she was in Africa where most of this kind of development work had taken place, uh, where she was just starting to meet all of these incredibly talented artisans. And so she she saw these kind of, and in many cases, ancestrally learned generations old crafts that these people were making that were just blowing her away in terms of how beautiful they were. And so she kind of had the light bulb go off that she wanted to start kind of marrying the two in a more holistic way. And so we started chatting more about it. And at the time, I just, I felt so connected to what she was saying. I think there was a part of me in that, that that window in LA where I was wanting to use my same skill set that I'd really honed in New York and the same things that I love doing. I love communicating, I love creative communications, but I wanted to do it for something other than fashion. I mean, to be totally honest, I wanted to do it for something for me that felt like it had more of a long term kind of beneficial effect on kind of just community and just like was less vapid than passion, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I had just kind of been putting this energy out into the universe. And then her and I really began talking earnestly about kind of what her goals were for, for Obaki as those were shifting for her. And so I started working with her. Uh, I basically started harassing her. I was like, well, do you need anyone? Do you need anyone? And so I started working for her remotely from LA. Uh, and it was a couple months, I think, after working for her that she, that I came up to Vancouver. Uh, to meet the rest of the team in person for like a, a week's worth of team building up here. And I hadn't even been back for almost eight years to Vancouver for a visit. The rest of my family now today lives in, in Fernie and in Calgary. So anytime I would come up, I'd be going there, and, but hadn't really been back to Vancouver. And so I came up to Vancouver to uh, meet my, meet the rest of the staff. And for, for that week long kind of, you know, you know, uh, period of meetings and 
and really fell in love with the city again fell in love with Vancouver it was beautiful it was in the summer the weather was insane and the city had grown and, and evolved and developed so much over that period of time that that a city that I was always kind of comparing to other cities suddenly I was like you know what it's kind of like way cooler here now yeah um, you're like I can be here for yeah I could longer. be here maybe mm-hmm. and there were just a bunch of different kind of little signs over that trip that that week here that were kind of pointing me to kind of come back and you know I had again like I'm not into the woo woo kind of hoo hoo stuff too much but I had kind of I think the most kind of riveting insane tarot reading of my life as well during that trip from a woman that I you know respect immensely and and that the whole kind of focus of that reading was basically relocation and and kind of all kind of pointing me back to moving back to Vancouver as well. So there were just all these little breadcrumbs. And so I uh, got back to L.A. And the first thing I did is after I got home was just kind of sit down with my husband. And we sat down with a cocktail. And I said, listen, I want to have a conversation. And he's like, you want to move back to Vancouver, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. He's like, I just knew. I knew it the whole trip. And I was like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, I just, I just figured as much." He's like, "You and Trina probably had so much fun, and you're probably, like, he's like, you just want to move back to Vancouver." And I was like, "Yeah, I do actually." He's like, "Okay, cool, let's do it." And I was like, "Well, what?" And I was like, "Well, okay, so that was easy. I thought it was going to be like a, you know, proper conversation and weighing out pros and cons." But he was just so, again, incredibly supportive and willing to kind of just throw, you know, you know, his weight into another round of cataclysmic change for us because you know we we'd gone through that a few times, and so. So I said, well, I, this was in, I think, June, this was in July, maybe June, July. And I said, well, let's wait until like November, you know, so we can kind of just get our shit together. He's like, no, let's go, let's go next month. I was like, what? Okay, so August, we moved back here. That was August 2019. And again, at that point, we had just lost one of our Great Danes, rest in peace, Berlin. So we threw our other Great Dane Tuesday and all of our belongings into another U-Haul and, uh, <laughs> And here we are. So we came back to Vancouver in 2019, yeah, in August, and we've been here since. And so now being here and being back, it just, it's like, I don't know if you've had this, but if you make a choice in your life where then you get all these affirmations afterwards that feel like it was the right thing, Mm -hmm. like where you know in every cell of your being that you made that right decision for yourself, it's been that kind of over and over and over again. And I... You know, I think it's like so like cliche and like cheesy, but it's like I'm really having this kind of my own kind of personal renaissance since being back here of like stepping into like being okay with all the decisions I've made throughout my career, being like I just have a certainty and a confidence and a, that I didn't have during all those kind of other phases. And I think it's it's again like it's just that really listening to kind of to that inner voice and I believe really strongly in intuition and kind of listening to your gut if you can kind of quiet everything else out to really hear that voice and I think that since being back here I've just had that kind of you know affirmed and confirmed in so many different ways and so um, it's been pretty incredible and then from again like getting to work with with Obaki during this phase has been so exciting because just again really getting to sync my teeth into you know working with an incredible group of people for a very incredible you know reason to kind of help impact the lives of all these different artisan groups around the world a network of like 300 plus which yeah, is a lot plus. of artisan yeah and, and so and all over the world you know and so it's it's incredibly exciting and so half of those artisans that we work with are called we call them our impact artisans and those are artisans that we work with on a deeper level through the Ovaki Foundation so whether or not that's providing them with uh, access to clean water or whether that's access to local markets just through something as simple as transportation because you know it's a village of potters in northern Uganda and they have to walk for three days to get to the closest place that they can sell one of the pots that they make so again it's like working very specifically in, in in a very nuanced way with each one of these different communities to help them kind of meet their own goals but again like it's just plug Trina I know you're my boss but like I'm not just saying this because you're my boss but just getting to work with someone who's that kind of sincere and inspiring and getting to see it happen on a daily basis is it's just like really inspiring to me and it's exactly again 
kind of a fulfillment of what I wanted, where I wanted my career to end up. Like, mm. again, like, and it's kind of, I get to work with one of my best friends, but I get to do it with an incredible group of people and for a cause that, that has so much value to me. So it's, I feel, yeah, I'm... I'm Very purpose-driven. It's completely purpose-driven. Mm-hmm. And and not in, like, a greenwashy, like, way. It's very... We have the receipts, and it's very real. And I get to see that every day. And so it's incredibly inspiring to me. Like, it's... I really do get to be one of those people I feel so fortunate that I love every kind of element and aspect of what I do. And it's... The product is stunning. Isn't it's it? It's really, yeah. really stunning. And, it's really beautiful. And I, I love that through this work, there's this preservation of these traditional yeah, practices. That's kind of one of the key pillars, right? Yeah. Is this understanding of preserving these kind of like this generationally learned kind of, you know, these craft techniques that in, in many ways are dying in many parts of the world. They and really it's are. because, you know, there's a lack of interest from new generations, younger generations who want to leave, you know, rural rural areas to move to big cities to get, you know, to get jobs that can offer them more. But then you have, like in Oaxaca, let's say, where there's beautiful, beautiful centuries-old pre-Hispanic times styles of pottery that are just dying out. You know, but fortunately, there are there's this resurgence and this interest in this kind of these, these different forms of indigenous craft all over the world. But that in and of itself is, is a mission that's that's very important to to the brand and to who Ovaki is. And it's, again, like that, I think, is so, so beautiful and important. You know? It really is. Yeah. And two, you know, it's it is it is a wonderful thing for the next generation of a culture to carry on these these traditions. Yeah. But if say they don't want to, mm-hmm. like the exposure that you're giving to these practices to other people who may be interested totally. in learning yeah. and carrying it on, you know, respectfully. Yeah. There is that aspect too. Very and that's much also, so. That's yeah. also beautiful. Yeah, I agree. I think there's power in that exposure, right? Mm-hmm. And I, and again, I think there's, it's about connecting consumers with, to your point, not only like a very beautiful product, but, but product that is made by a human, like by a specific human. It's not made in a factory. In many cases, it's made using no tools whatsoever, very primitive tools. And, uh, but it's connecting customers with, with that story of the human being that's made the product that they choose to have in their home. So whether that's a rug, a handloom rug, or whether that's a beautiful a vase, you know, whatever that looks like, it's just we we strive to really connect to make that connection for consumers, and I think that is so important in what can be a very you know in today's day and age where I think we've lost a, a big part of that connection, you know, and it's when you think about that if you walk through a home where you know like oh Jose from Oaxaca wove this rug or Amadou carved that wooden bowl like you're going to value that piece in such a different way. And so that concept suddenly of what an heirloom item is. So mm-hmm. not only is it sustainable in the sense that you're moving away from throwaway culture, you're saying let's buy less, but let's buy better and let's have objects that we want to have in our lives for a really long time. So that in itself speaks to sustainability, but also talks, yeah, like I said, to that kind of that notion of what an heirloom object is. It's, you know, something that you want to have not only around yourself, but you want to pass down. Mm. And so, but again, being able to say years from now, like you understand, you know, the human set of hands that actually produce that object. I think there's something that's so magical about that and also so important right now too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the appreciation probably goes both ways for, for, Jose, it does. to know that yeah. someone bought something he made. Yeah. Oh, he That's probably feels so great. the other thing because, you know, Trina, she, she talks to these people every day. Her WhatsApp is blowing up. Like, we talk about that in, in our brand language and stuff, but it's but it really is very true. Like, she connects, we all as a team connect in many times with these artisans, you know, all the time. And so... We right now currently have a, a pop up happening in Holt Renfrew, and you know, but as we were launching, and Trina was sending around pictures to some of the artisans whose work is featured there in this very kind of you know important big kind of platform, uh, and just hearing their excitement and 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 just being about that kind of level of exposure for them and what that means for them in terms of pride more than anything, like to be able to just feel so seen by a community of people that they don't even know, but that they know exists out there somewhere. But that kind of, the, that electric excitement that, that I've seen on their faces just by understanding that there is a group of people 
out there that appreciates what they do in such an incredible way has been, to your point, it's like this exchange, right, mm-hmm. that happens. And it's it's pretty magical getting to see it happen on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So listeners, please go to Holtz. Yeah. The How long is it there for? It's there till May 9th. So just go to Obaki.com. Okay. <laughs> I was like, you have a couple of days after this drops yeah, to right. go see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have five days, yeah, guys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. just a couple more questions sure, for yeah, you. Yeah. Um, so your home is stunning. It oh, has thank so you. much character. Thank you. And what I love about it is, in a time where everyone is trying to have these really minimal contemporary homes. Oh no, baby. No, it's like organized <laughs> maximalism. Yeah, like I, that's kind of my mo right there. You I hit the nail it. on the head. I've always been kind of like a intentional maximalist Mm -hmm. i i there's not a single thing in my house that isn't exactly where i want it to be so it's again it's very intentional but i love the composition of things and again i think you know my husband and i've been together for now almost you know almost 15 years and so i was collecting art before meeting him he had pieces so we've just built this collection of you know in a lot of cases artwork as opposed and, and and objects that that we've kept with us despite the fact that we've moved like so many times and country to country and we've kept all of these things with us. And so I am I feel comfort in it, but yes, it's a very kind of curated chaos that makes me feel kind of grounded. Like I do, again, I love a very kind of minimal aesthetic. It's just not how I want to live my life. Like mm-hmm. my home will always be that. Yeah. Well, it's very it's it's very warm and it's like a, yeah. a mystery in every corner. You're Ooh, sort of like, good. where did that come from? Where did that come I love from? It. <laughs> but you mentioned art, which yeah. was which is a yeah. perfect segue into my next question mm-hmm. because I noticed that you have a really stunning art collection. Mm-hmm. I read that you've been collecting since you were in your twenties. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, and I know Joey yeah. is also into art, um, yeah. as you said. Um, do you guys collect in a certain theme? Like, is everything in there? If you looked at it all, you're like, okay, you collect within these parameters, or is it more like, no, no, it's just what calls? It's it's what calls. It's intuitive. It's definitely, and again, it sounds hippy dippy, but it's just being drawn to a piece. Like it's, and again, he has a very, I have a very strong eye. My husband Joey does as well. However, more often than not, we're aligned. Sometimes we have to duke it out where if one of us really believes in something and the other one doesn't, we have to really kind of state our case if we have to get the other person on board. But for the most case, it's been quite easy to to mesh our own styles together into this kind of beautiful kind of mess that it is now. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's, again, more about being drawn by individual pieces for sure, mm-hmm. you know, mm. yeah. Well, it's it's beautiful. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, a really beautiful collection. Yeah. So, a couple more questions. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking about your your husband Joey, yeah. and by the way, he has a really fantastic energy. He does. He it's really, really does. Infectious. Yeah. Very infectious. Yeah. Uh, what do you love and appreciate most about him? His well, first start. I mean, hands down, his sense of humor. You know, again, it's it sounds like a freaking Hallmark card, but I really do get to live with my best friend. Like we just laugh all day every day together and to me that's always been something that's so incredibly important to me but uh aside from that he's one of the most talented creative people I've ever met he's he's a musician and he's classically trained in opera and he can he would say that he can't play any instrument but he he really can if he sits down and decides to do it he's just incredibly talented in that sense and then also just the uh the unwavering support I've always had from him like he's always just believed in me with a purity and with a fervor that I don't think most people experience in their lives from their partners like he's always really he's my biggest cheerleader and it's not like he it's it's very sincere and so I feel grateful all the time and don't get me wrong like any relationship we've had phases where we want to kill each other and there's ups and downs etc but but those those bits of it are so vastly outweighed by just all of the great stuff that that I think uh you know it's it just leaves me in a very you know in a a place of like extreme gratitude and it's we've had to learn a ton as well like we've had to learn how to communicate together very well I think that's something that we were really good at today but that we always weren't necessarily always that good at but 
But I think it's just that support. Like he's really just believed in me, whether that's a kooky idea I'm having, whether that's my taste in music, whether that's <laughs> like, it just whatever it looks like, he's willing to throw his kind of full support behind me. And I think that's something that, that has a lot, a lot of value to it. It really does. Yeah. I've been thinking, and he's incredibly handsome too. <laughs> he is. Yeah. Yes, he is. <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking. This word came up in um, the last podcast recording I did with yeah. a guest, but it's it's a word that I've been mulling over a lot lately yeah. when I think about relationships. But but the word devotion, in yeah. but in a healthy way. Yeah. You know, not on a yeah. pedestal way. Yeah. And I made I it that- a big kind of point early on to kind of stress this idea of of really what a partnership looks like a partnership in the sense of being on the same team so always rooting for that other person never shit talking your partner with other people like just always wanting the best out of them and and even though there's moments where we both have to we miss the mark on that I think that really needing to know that we're fighting for each other at all times and that ultimately we are kind of you know we're a team I think drives that sense of of, of how you kind of explain it as devotion, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like I never, ever, ever, ever question, you know, his commitment to me, which is, again, something I think is pretty special, you know? Um, and and that's just, as much as that's proven daily in, in different kind of very kind of mundane actions, it's it's just this this kind of gut feeling that, that I have this assurance of through, through who he is and how he's treated me as a person throughout, mm. the, you know? The yeah. past 15 years so. so beautiful yeah yeah it's true the next question i have is um if you were if your mother was sitting in this chair yeah. what would you say to her right now what would i say to her right now i mean i think at first when she first passed away there was a lot of those times where i and let me preface this by saying that when her mother my grandmother passed away uh my mother was devastated because she she was just she was so sad that there were so many times when her mother had called her just to talk and my mom didn't want to talk. So my mom was very fixated on this idea of all these missed opportunities to, to spend more time with her own mother. And so I, my mom and I, like I said, became, you know, so incredibly close that she, she came and visit us multiple times a year, wherever we were. And like, we had a lot of time together, but I think I would just want to tell her again that I, that I, I would want to apologize again to how I treated her as a teenager, even though her and I had this conversation in, in, in maybe a slightly different way when she was still alive. I think I would just want to let her know that I saw her and that I saw, I understood her motivations and I understood the purity of what that looked like. And I, I think there's again, this idea that kind of the older that we get, we're able to, look back because of our own experiences and understand with a new lens kind of kind of how we've interacted with with those kind of key people in our lives and I think you know even though I'm not I'm not certainly getting down on myself I was still trying to figure out who I was as a person and but I made a lot of missteps as a teenager in terms of how I treated her and and I think I would just like to articulate that to her maybe in a really clear way um and just to you know just a hugger but <laughs> but yeah yeah <laughs> yeah mm. but I still feel an incredible closeness to her again I was able before she passed I had a really impactful incredible special period of time with her um that I'm very grateful for that a lot of people don't have um so I I still feel very close with her uh, you know it's but uh but yeah I'd want to say those things to her mm. yeah. her spirit isn't around yeah totally mm-hmm. yeah my final question mm-hmm. that I ask everyone yeah. with what you do, what is it that you want to leave behind in the world? I mean, I guess I know this because I've listened to your podcast, but uh, <laughs> I don't know why I didn't prepare for it. Um, uh, what would I want to leave the world? Um, I guess a sense of community. Uh, you know, again, I think the people around me, I something I've always really loved about what I've been able to do with my career is kind of foster creativity and kind of build people up and support people. You know, I think that I tried my hardest, you know, um, with my own company, with my current role, any role that I can to kind of to encourage people to kind of to bring the best out in them. And so that's something that that is not only important, I think, to me, but I think it's something that I do just um, 
because I do it. Um, so I I want to have at least the people that I've affected or the people that I've been with to be left with that idea that I I built them up and that I gave them the opportunity to kind of shine in their own way. And you know I. I think now with my current role, I have the opportunity to be doing something that has a little bit more meaning to it, whatever meaning, however you define meaning. But, but I don't think I'm ever gonna, you know, you know, in, invent like fucking cure for cancer or anything. So it's more about this kind of legacy of of yeah, kind of of building people up and kind of that sense of community and and um, friendship, for lack of a better word, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that because it reminds me what you said about your teenage years and how you found the punk scene and those yeah. people gave you that community. Yeah, totally. And that friendship. And yeah, so that's what exactly. you're going to leave behind too. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Full circle. Yeah. Oh, I felt a little teary saying that yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> CJ, yeah, thank man. you for sharing your story thank and you being so, so much open for me. and vulnerable. I really, really enjoyed this. I and enjoyed it too. And thank you. You're. You're incredibly easy to chat with, so it's been it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. and I'm sure I will see you soon. Oh yes, you will. You're not <laughs> Let's getting rid of me a, now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it a dance party next time. Yeah. Oh, you're on. You're thank on. You, thank you for being here. Thanks, May. If you enjoyed that last conversation, be sure to check out more episodes with Craft on Spotify and guest photo galleries on the website at wearethecraft.com. Thanks again for listening.